part like that. So the and the non-calculate part's a little bit longer. So the first part of the test, no calculator, and the only formulas that I give you on this test are going to be, you know, these things right here. I'll give you the the things for linear velocity uh, and those kind of things like that. So that's all I give you. Of course, you have to know the the unit circle and all that kind of stuff. So you want to know like the uh, linear velocity, angular velocity formulas. Kind of the key thing is that thing right there. And then this formula and this formula right there. So I'll give that and that's it. Okay. All right. Now I'm going to kind of move through this. And that's posted on D2L. So those are the formulas that I'm going to give you. I just give you that same formula sheet. Okay. So this is just some practice problems. Uh, I rewrite different tests every semester. But these are the highlighted areas that you can count on happen to know how to do. So one of the first things I always do is give a problem where you're just telling me where things are positive in which quadrant. So we we learned all these different strategies. I think one thing that I taught you was, uh, what did I teach you? All students take calculus. What else did I teach? All science teachers crazy. Okay, take your pick. Okay. So you can do it this way if you want to. So the idea, now notice on this, I can put any trig function in there. So I'm just kind of focusing on sine, cosine, and tangent like that. Okay, what's positive in quadrant one? Everything. Everything. Okay, that's what the all means. So that goes like this. Can you guys see what I'm writing? Isn't this cool? Okay, now I don't even have a left hand that's blocking everything off anymore. This is awesome. Okay, what does the S mean? Sine's positive in that quadrant. What's the deal with everything else? Negative. Negative, like that. Okay. What's the T for take? Tangent's positive. Everything else is negative. Okay. And then the C for calculus means that's positive. Everything else is negative. That's a real fast way to learn how to do that. Now, the other thing is, uh, now, it, of course, the sine and cosecant go together, right? So the cosecant would be the same as the sine. The secant would be the same as the cosine. And the cotangent is the same as the tangent, like that. So you want to be able to do that. That's a real fundamentally important thing that you want to be sure to know how to do. Point blank. Always give that same kind of problem. Okay. Another problem that I always check you on is I give you a point, you tell me the trig function. So you have to obviously know all of these definitions on the on this on these. So what's the definition of the sine? Y over R. How about the cosine? Tangent. Okay, if you don't know that, the, t the test will be a disaster for you. Okay, what's the reciprocal of the sine? Cosecant. Cosecant. What's the reciprocal of the cosine? <coughs> Secant. Okay, so you got that. And then, of course, the cotangent's x over y. Okay, so you got to know that. By now, hopefully, you know that. And uh, generally on this, I'm going to give some sort of a point. So I've given x is negative 5. I've given y is negative 12. How do you find r if you don't know what it is? You do Pythagorean theorem, okay? Sometimes on the test I give you something that you might already know. Do you already know what r is? Out of curiosity? Some of you know it's 13. If you don't know it doesn't matter. That's called a Pythagorean triple. So again, what you would go through on, do the, on, on this, you'd just go r squared is negative 5 squared. Uh, plus negative 12 squared, and I'm not going to make anything since you're not allowed to use a calculator that's very complicated with big numbers, so that's just 2544. I remember I gave this very problem on a test one time, and you know why students messed up? Because they didn't know what the square root of 169 was without a calculator. If you don't know what a square root is without a calculator, you just have to multiply backwards, don't you? Mm -hmm. So you just have to try some numbers backwards, and then you'd end up getting 13. Okay, like that. So now it's just kind of a simple matter of uh, putting it all together now so to get your answer. So the sign, what's going to be the answer to the sign now? Okay, negative 12 over 13. So what's the cosecant then? Okay, it doesn't matter where you put the negative. It's just negative. Okay, what's the cosine? Negative 5 over 13. What's the secant? Okay, reciprocal. Negative 13 over 5. What's the tangent? Okay, now is that going to be positive or negative? Positive. It's going to be positive because you got two negatives, so you can do it in your head if you want to. Twelve fifths, and this is going to be five twelfths like that. Okay, real simple problem. If you know your definitions, that's always a classic way to test students over whether they know their definitions or not. Okay, all right. 
be sure, like, if it turns out that something you have to rationalize a denominator on, you want to be sure you do that. Okay? Does that look good? Yeah. A Pythagorean triple, yeah, is when you have three whole numbers that make up the sides of a right triangle. One example is 5, 12, 13. Another one's 3, 4, 5. There's an infinite number of them. Usually the ones I remember are 3, 4, 5, 5, 12, 13, 6, 8, 10. Those are honestly the only ones I remember. I think another one's 7, 24, 25. I remember that one too. But you don't have to. It does save you a little bit of time if you know some of those things then. Okay, a couple other classic things that you would want to be expected to do. Convert uh, degrees to radians and radians to degrees, okay? We always have this on the gateway test. So how do you convert degrees to radians? Multiply by pi over 180, okay? And what I find a lot of times on these problems is students do it okay, but they don't know how to reduce their fraction, okay? So when you do this, you have 20 pi over 180. One of the best things you can do on this is just kind of cross out the zeros. Then you can divide by 2. And you can do that in your head. So what's the answer? Pi over 9. Okay, so pi over 9 is your answer to your problem, okay? And I'm looking at just some kind of a thing that nothing with decimals or anything like this because you're not allowed to use your calculator on this part of the exam, just straightforward with reducing, okay? How do you convert uh, something that's in radians to degrees? you got two ways. You can multiply it by 180 over pi. The way I always look at this is pi is 180 degrees, okay? That's just as easy. And then, of course, you want to reduce the fraction, okay? So you want to be able to do that arithmetic, okay? Uh, 180 over 9 is 20. If you can't do that in your head, go to the side of your paper and crunch it out. And then 5 times 20 is what? 100, so that's 100 degrees, okay? So those are a couple of things that are guarantees. Everything on this fir first page is guarantee stuff. You want it, These are basic things that you have to know at the beginning of a trigonometry <laughs> class, okay? All right, so far so good? Okay, all right. Okay, uh, so let me just kind of move this down here. Now, another thing is, since we're talking about graphing, and graphing tends to be one of the harder areas on this test for students. So we're going to focus a little bit on that then. So one thing is that we're, we've all we've really talked about so far is the sine and cosine. So the graphs are revolving around sine and cosine. One thing I want you to be able to do is if you're given a, um, an equation, just make sure that you know what all those numbers do, okay? So one thing on this one is, is you've got to find what the, what the period is on this. So the period we learned is, what's the general formula for a period? 2 pi over omega. Is the period ever negative? No. No, it's always positive, okay? So omega is always that number that's in front of x, okay? So that's omega. So what you would get on this is you would get... 2 pi over 3, okay, is your answer, okay? So we haven't even talked about tangent and cotangent graphs yet, so that's pretty standard. What's the amplitude on this? 7, okay? Amplitude is this number, okay? Is the amplitude ever negative? No. No, okay? You do the absolute value of that, so it's 7, like that, okay? Now, the phase shift a lot of times is where students mess up a little bit, and the phase shift comes from this number right here, the pi, but that has to be in a factored form. So you have to pay attention to this part of the problem right here. So I'm just going to rewrite this as y equals negative sine, negative cosine, factor the 3 out, and then we got to figure out what goes there. So this is another area where students a lot of times overlook is you have to put that in a factored form, unless it's already in a factored form. So what you do is you take that pi and you divide it by 3. And then that's what goes in there as pi over 3 goes like that then, okay? So what's the phase shift? Pi, pi over 3. three. Okay, which way? To the, right. to the right, good. Okay, like that. So you've got to be in a factored form. And anytime that you, fa you take, you always take whatever number's in front of x out, so you take that number divided by that, and that gives you the phase shift, okay? Uh, what is the vertical translation on this problem? Eight-thirds eight up, okay. That's what that number is doing. That's adding basically to the y value, so that's going to take you up eight thirds like that. Okay? Is the now I didn't ask on this, but would this uh, problem have a reflection over the x-axis? Yes. Yeah, because I could ask that. And how do you know that? Because of the negative. Okay. So you could also say on this that you have a 
reflection over the x-axis. So see, that's really all the things that we've learned. So the phase shift is right or left. Okay, that's the one you got to study. If it's minus, it goes to the right. If it's plus, it goes to the left. So that's going to go to the right. And then is this going to go up or down? Eight-thirds okay. goes up, okay? So that's pretty logical, okay? <laughs> up eight-thirds like that, okay? So that's one thing that's also just kind of a basic guarantee on a, on a test in trigonometry is an equation, do you know all the parts? Not the graphing. We'll get to the graphing, but do you know all the possibilities? Okay, does that look good? Okay, sine or cosine. It's both the same on sine or cosine. Nothing changes. Okay, now we're going to get down to the graphs, and I'm going to go through some of the different things that I look at. So I kind of look at this at different levels. Okay, one graph I always kind of test you over sine and cosine, maybe with just one transformation. What I mean by that is maybe there's an amplitude change, maybe there's a, a reflection, not, there's maybe not several things going on in the problem. Now one thing that you guys definitely want to know, you can do the test faster if you know this now. So one thing is on this is if you look at a graph, now I'm just going to look at a cosine graph and a sine graph. Sometimes this thing's a little hard to draw on here. Uh, but just to remind you of how a cosine graph goes and how a sine graph goes. Okay, where does a cosine graph start? If it's just a basic cosine graph, where does it start? Zero, one. Okay, so that's real helpful to know that. And then it just cycles through the five key points. So now it goes to the x-intercept. Then it goes there, goes there, goes there like that. So if you get that memorized, you can do your graphs faster. If you don't have that memorized, you've got to <laughs> do the unit circle and you've got to work out what those values are, okay? If you had a sine wave with these same values, where's the sine start? Zero zero. zero, zero. Okay, so that's important. If you get those two things memorized, then, like I said, all the graphs can be put together pretty quickly, okay? So those things, you want to make sure that you know the basic ones like that. Okay, now this problem right here, I am wanting you to graph this. Typically, I give you an interval of what to graph it over. So we're going from 0 to 2 pi, okay? One thing that's kind of important on this one is to figure out what the period is and then use the period to figure out what the increment is. So let me talk a little bit about what I mean by that. Okay, if there's no number in front of x, what's the period? 2, two, pi. two pi, okay? If there is a number in front of x, which we'll get to here in a few minutes, then you have to change the period and change the increment. What did I say to do to, to figure out how to increment the x-axis? This is a big thing. Did I say that? Divide by 4. Okay. So what you do on this is you take the, the period 2 pi and you divide it by 4. We looked at that a little bit uh, in the last section. So that divides by 4 to give pi over 2. Now what I mean by that is, is you actually need to count out your x-axis by pi over 2. Now that's pretty standard if you don't have a period change. So you're going to go like this. Okay, that's going to be pi over 2. This is going to be 2 pi over 2. But what's 2 pi over 2? It's pi. Then you go to 3 pi over 2. Then you get to 2 pi over 2, which, or no, I'm sorry, 2 um, pi, 2 pi like that. So you're going 1 pi over 2, 2 pi over 2, 3 pi over 2, 4 pi over 2, but reducing the fractions. Okay, what is this negative 2 going to do to this graph of the cosine? Okay, it's going to reflect, and what else? It's going to stretch, right? It's an amplitude. It's going to stretch. So it should make sense on this that we want to make the y-axis go all the way to 2, and we want to make that go down to negative 2, like that, okay? Now, you guys can do this in one stage. Now, like on a problem like this, sometimes I may say, I may say graph one, uh, in two stages. I may say get the final product. So one of the things I'm going to do on this is I'm just going to graph just this, just y equals cosine x, and then we'll transform it. But you don't have to do that. Okay, so the cosine starts there. Starts at the high point, then it goes there, goes there goes there. Okay, see so if you get that memorized, then you can work these graphs out fast, and that's part of what I want you to be able to do is work your graphs out pretty quickly. Yeah. Can on the test can we put a dotted line for the first one? Yes. Okay. 
yeah, you can always do that. You're not required. Like on this problem, if you just want to give me the final graph, I'm totally okay with that. But if you want to do, you know, different <laughs> steps, just do it like this, okay? All right. Now, what we're going to do on this, I'm going to go ahead and just put this together now. So what happens is, and this is real important, is what that does is that multiplies all of the y values by negative 2. This is the best way to learn this is to know the math behind this. Okay, so what's the y value at this point right here? 1. What's 1 times negative 2? So that point goes down there. So see what it's doing is it's reflecting and stretching at the same time. Okay, the y value of this point is 0. So what's 0 times negative 2? Still 0. So see, that doesn't change. Nothing changes on that point. And then where does this point go? It's going to go up to 2. Okay, because negative 1, you're, again, you're taking negative 2 times negative 1, so that takes you up to 2 like that. And once you get, you know, two or three points, you can figure out the rest, can't you? I hope you figured that out by now. So what you do is just kind of sketch that in like that. Next point's going to go back to 0. And next point like this. This is so hard. Because what I have to do is I have to look at the computer while I draw. And that's so hard. There's a learning curve doing this thing. Okay, so that's your answer. Okay, that's it. So what I'm kind of looking at on this, a lot of times I give different levels of problems. Uh, so this one to me is just an example of amplitude reflection. Not a whole lot going on on the problem. Okay, you guys follow that okay? Okay. Be sure that you memorize the basic cosine and psi. Because if you don't, you end up taking too much time on these problems. Okay. All, to me, all you got to do is remember the cosine starts high, sine starts there. Okay. That's all I remember. I know how it cycles through the rest of the points. Okay. All right. Any questions about anything? Okay. Does that look good? Okay. All right. We'll get to the ones that are a little bit more complicated now. Okay, so let's do this one. This one is an example that's got a, a period change. And these are the ones that students struggle a little bit more with. So one of the things that typically that we need to do on, on a problem like this is you need to figure out what the period is. Okay, how do you know that this problem has a period change to it? It has a number in front of X. That's how you know. So that means the cycle's either going to go this way or this way. It's either going to kind of shrink or expand like that. So the formula is 2 pi over omega, with omega always being absolute value. I haven't been really worried about negative numbers in front of x. So what we're going to do is 2 pi. Then we're going to divide that by 1 third. Okay. How do you divide fractions? Reciprocal. Well, I see little things like that all the time in this class. So your period 6 pi, okay? So I might ask you on a problem to find that. Now, here's the whole key to this problem. This is the absolute key. If you don't do this, the problem will be a disaster. Okay, how do you find the increment of the x-axis? What did I always say? Divide by 4. Be sure you study that. If you have a period change, what you always do is you always take the period and you divide it by 4. Okay, and that will tell you how we're going to make, set up our table. So we're going to take 6 pi divided by 4. Of course, you would want to reduce that fraction, so that reduces down to 3 pi over 2. Okay, so that's what you're going to do on your table as you're going to set this up. Now, you can start the table at 0. Uh, there's no phase shift or anything like we talked about last week, so just start at 0 and now start incrementing by this value like this. Okay, that's real important. Okay, all right. All right, you okay? Yeah, I'm good. Okay, so we got 3 pi over 2 is the next one. Now just start counting this out. What comes after, th what comes after 3 pi over 2? 2 pi, 3 pi. Yeah, 6 pi over 2, yeah. right? 9 pi over 2, uh, then what? 12 pi over 2 and so forth. Of course, I want you to reduce fractions. I do take off if you don't reduce fractions. So this is 3 pi. This one is 9 pi over 2. And then that one is 6 pi. Okay, one of the things I talked about, when you count this increment out, what's significant about 6 pi? What does 6 pi mean in this problem? That's the period. Okay, so see what we've done is we got five key points. If you start at 0, 
and count that increment out, you should eventually get to whatever the period is. Okay, so that's kind of a self-checking. You know, you're on the right track. Okay, right? Now, what I'm going to do next here is um, I'm going to go down and construct the graph, and I'm going to fill in the Y values. You can do this in, in either order. So let's go ahead and go down here, and we're going to go ahead and fill in the graph. Now, I think on the graph I, I just said graph over one period, so it makes sense to go from 0 to 6 pi. Okay, as long as you have five key points, though, then you'd be in good shape. So, so I'm just going to go down here, and then we're going to go ahead and just put the, the increments on here. So let's see, we had 3 pi over 2, then we had 3 pi, then we had 9 pi over 2, and then we had 6 pi, okay, like that. So we're graphing y equals sine of 1 third x, okay? Now, what's the amplitude on this problem? One. One. Okay, is there any up-down stuff going on? No. no. So how should I do my y-axis? One, one, one. Negative one to one, exactly. Okay, so there's no transformations on the amplitude, so go like that. Okay, now we're ready to put this together. Now the thing is on this is there is no phase shift. No phase shift, so that means the first point, where does the sign start for the first point? Zero. Zero. Okay, so you just go like this. Okay, put a dot there. Where's the next point going to go? One. To the max. Okay, like that. Then it's going to go back there. It's going to go there. And then there. And see, all we did is we adjusted the period. Nothing else changed. Okay, so those Y values on a basic sine wave do not change. So that means <laughs> it's so hard to draw a sine wave on that. So it goes like that. That's okay. You can draw them crooked, too, okay? Just don't draw them like this. I always see students draw their sine waves like this. No, they're curves, okay? All right, so that's pretty important. So that's it. The problem's done. Now, uh, the next thing that I wanted to just kind of remind you guys of on this is this problem's checkable. Now, what you can do is you can go through and just and just fill in your, your points now. So this is 0, 1, 0, negative one zero like that and then you're basically done with that uh, and then the next thing is that I wanted to show you is you can actually go through on this and you can tell you're right so this to me is a real important thing to do on the test you don't have to do this but if you pick any point on here and, and it doesn't make any difference let's just pick three pi and if we just took the the equation y equals sine of one third x and replaced in 3 pi. The reason I'm choosing 3 pi is because it's easy. Okay? So what happens is the threes cross out, so you're doing y equals the sine of pi. All I'm trying to show you is how you can tell you're right on this problem. Okay? Well, the sine of pi on a unit circle, what is the point when um, when you're at pi radians? Zero. Negative one zero. So the sine is zero, right? Okay, so sine of pi is zero. Well, look at your graph, 3 pi, 0. So you're right. Now, why in the world wouldn't you do that as a student? My point is you can tell you're right on these problems. You can tell, okay? All right? You guys are going to get to this gateway test eventually where you have a, uh, you'll always have a graph on it of a sine or cosine. To me, check and tell you're right. Don't turn something in unless you know it's right, okay? So you could do that for any of these points. Uh, to me, if you check like two points and they're right, then you're probably right on the graph. What do you think? Okay, so that's the idea. Okay? All right, so that is another one. So what I've shown you so far is a graph with an amplitude change, a graph with a period change. Then usually what I do is a graph that might have a phase shift and several things, one that's a little bit more advanced. Okay? All right, so is there any questions about this graph and how I approach that? Okay, so the whole key on that is doing that that increment. If you don't do that right, problem doesn't work very good. Okay. All right. So let's um, let me move this down. Oh come on! Don't do this. This thing always does unusual things sometimes. <clears throat> okay. So let's go down and look at this one. And um, and just take a look at how this one goes. This is one that's a little bit more advanced. So I do give a problem. On the test, usually it's got a little bit of everything, okay? So if you can do this, all the other graphs will seem simple to you. So one of the things going to do on this one is 
let's just start by identifying everything. Okay, what's the amplitude? One half. Okay, one half. What is that one half going to do to the wave? Shrink it. Shrink it. Okay. All right. Now, how do you find the period on this graph? 2 pi, two two two. Two pi over omega. Omega is that number 2. It's always the number that's in front of x. Okay. So the period is pi. Okay. We have a period change. So you need to change the values on the x-axis. So how do you find the increment on the x-axis? Divide the period by 4. Okay. So you always do that. Okay. Pi divided by 4, that's huge, Okay, so you have that. So that's going to tell you in this table that those are the things that you want to use. Okay. Now, do you know what the phase shift is? It's pi over 4. Now, this thing is in a factored form, right? Okay. Previously, I did a problem where it wasn't in a factored form. If it's in a factored form, okay, then that is the phase shift. So that phase shift is pi over 4, and it's going to go which way? To the right, okay? So you got to know that, okay? Now, what is this negative 2 going to do? It's going to take you down 2. Okay, so notice this thing has a lot of things going on in it, okay? So you got to approach this problem in a certain way. you got to find all those pieces to begin with, okay? So everybody got that, that part down okay? Okay, all right. Now what we're going to do is... And one of the things I do on this is if, if there's a phase shift, I try to make it show up on one of these points on the increment just for simplicity, okay? If that phase shift is not on one of these increments, I may do that a couple of times on homework, but I don't do that on a test. So we're just going to start counting by the increment. So we can start anywhere we want to. I'm just going to start at zero. That's a good place to start. Then I'm going to go pi over four. The next one is going to be 2 pi over 4, so that's pi over 2. Then you've got 3 pi over 4. Then you've got uh, 4 pi over 4, which is pi. Okay, see, pi is the period. So what we have, see, is by counting out that increment, you've guaranteed yourself to have five key points right there. Okay, that's why that increment's so important. Okay, now what we're going to do on this is... I'm going to go through and we're going to graph this. You can graph this in, uh, in one stage or you can just fill it out if you want to like this. So I'm going to go ahead and jump down to the graph here for a minute. And what we're going to do is just graph everything except, except the uh, amplitude and the down thing. We're going to do the phase shift too. So I'm going to focus on that just a little bit here. Okay. So let's go down on this graph and let's get these five key points put together here. <clears throat> so I've got pi over 4, uh, pi over 2, then what did I have? 3 pi over 4, then I had pi. Now we do have a phase shift on this, so I'm going to take this out one more point, maybe to 5 pi over 4 like that. Okay. Now what we're going to graph, I'm going to do this graph in stages, although you guys are not required to do that, what I'm going to do is y equals the sine. I'm not going to worry about the amplitude. I'm just going to worry about 2 times x minus pi over 4. And again, I'm not going to worry about the translation. The way I like to teach this is if you have an amplitude change and a translation, then just do this part right here. Just do this only. Then we can adjust those y values caused by the amplitude and the up-down thing. Okay. So one of the key things on this that's real important, if I give you a graph with a phase shift, is the first point that you plot is you want to start at, at the phase shift, okay, like this. All right, so here's the thing that you do now. Now, see, you don't even have to look at your unit circle or anything. Where does the sign, a basic sign, start? What's the very first point? Zero, zero. zero. That's all you got to worry about is that. Okay, so that's zero, zero. However, we're going to phase shift to that pi over 4 to the right, so that point is now there. So you put your first dot right there, okay, like that. Okay, so always start at the phase shift, then work yourself up from there, okay? Now, I'm going to go ahead on the y-axis. You know, you can kind of pick how that goes. We do have, what did this problem do? Was it a down, what was it? I don't know what the problem is now. Down 2, okay. All right, 
And then there was a one half, so let's just see if that will kind of take care of everything there, okay? Now, so since we started at the phase shift, the next point is going to go to its high point. Now, we're not doing the amplitude yet. We're going to do that next. Then that's going to go there, down to its min, down, and then to that. See, I notice I went out one more point because of the phase shift. So that's why I took that all the way out to 5 pi over 4. Okay, now I can go through and dash that in like that, and then I've got basically what that graph looks like. Okay, all right, does that look okay? Okay, if you've got a phase shift, that's where you want to start. Okay, and always do amplitude, reflections, and up-down stuff at the very end of the problem. What you do is you do X first, then you do Y first, okay? So now we're going to try to put this, this all together now. Um, so what I'll do with this one now is we're going to graph, and let's see, this was one-half. I think the problem was one-half sine 2X minus pi over 4. Then it was a minus 2, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. Now, see, you can do this all in one step, okay? Now, what I'm going to have you do on this, now I'm going to go just kind of down here, and do this like this. The y value of this point is zero. So what you're going to do is you're going to take one half times zero minus two. See what you're doing is that one half multiplies y values, then the minus two takes you down two, like that. So you just turn this into an arithmetic problem. Okay? So what's a half times zero minus two? Minus two. Minus two. There's your first point, guaranteed. Okay? Now you could go up now if you wanted to. I'll kind of do this now but I'll put this back down here so you can go up right now. If you want to go ahead and put that in your table, you can, okay? So we got that first point established like that then, okay? Now the next point, what's the y value? It's 1, right? So we're going to do 1 half times 1 minus 2. And you can use decimals if you want to. That's a half minus 2, so that's negative 1.5 or negative 1 and a half, okay, like that, okay? So just go down and estimate that you have that. So see what's happening on this is the problem is the one half is causing it to shrink. The key points are shrinking. So if you want to go up to your table now for pi over 2 and put in negative 1.5, then you can go ahead and do that now. Okay. Okay, so we got that. Now let's get another point. So this one is 0. Didn't we already crunch out 0 down here? Yeah, so that's going to go back to where? Minus 2. Okay, same thing. Yeah, stop that. Sometimes this thing jumps around. Doesn't do what it's supposed to do. Okay, so we got that. Now we got move on to the next point. So now this point has what y value? Negative 1. So you're going to do 1 half times negative 1 minus 2. So that's negative 1 half minus 2. So that's negative 2 and a half or negative 2.5. So when you plot that point, just go down like that. Now you can tell that's going to be the stop that. That's going to be the minimum right there. And then this point is going to go back down there like that. So now you've got one period graphed by doing that. Okay? That's not very good looking sine wave, but you get the idea. Okay? All right? So see once you get that phase shift established in the period change, then Always work with amplitude change and up-down things. And just do it in one step, and then you're done. So if you want to go up now and figure out the table here, so this is going to be, we said, negative 2 there. What did we say that was? That was negative 2.5. And then you could go ahead, like on the test, I don't care what you do. Like if you went to 5 pi over 4 and did negative 2, you're okay. Or you could also kind of work backwards. And then this point, if you went to 0, would go back to negative 1.5 like that, okay? All right, and I'll go back and display the graph if I need to like that, okay? All right, now that's probably a good example of, of, a, of probably the most sophisticated graph that I could ask. That's got everything in it, okay? So what you want to do with that, again, is start at the phase shift, maybe do that in a color, and then work with the amplitude and vertical translations. That's how you do it. You need me to uh, turn up to the table? Yes. Okay, all right. Okay. All right, you guys got any question or anything I need to clarify on that? Okay, does that look okay? The first Which one? Oh, okay. Oh, now the phase shift, pi over 4 was negative 2. 
So if you kind of look at my graph, see what I did is I just did the graph. I just kind of predicted where the pattern's going to go. Because once you get three points, if you get the minimum, the midpoint, and the maximum, then you know where the rest of them are going to go. Okay, like that. Okay, any questions? Does that look pretty good? Okay. All right, so that's kind of the graphing that you see is a couple of more basic ones and then one that's got it all. Okay. And these are the kind of things that you're going to see eventually on the gateway test with just sine and cosine stuff. Okay. All right. So let's move down here. So this will be a something that you will do one time on the test. Of course, you already did this on the quiz. So I'm going to run through on this and um, just kind of show you what I want to, what I do on the unit circle. Now I do this um, only one time. I do this on the first test. So I do grade you on the unit circle just like you did on the quiz. So have you guys got that down pretty good? Okay. All right. I'm just going to very quickly do some of it here because the goal on this is to be able to do this fast. Okay. On this test, you want to do this fast. You don't want to waste a lot of time when you're doing this now. Okay. Stop that. Okay. So let's go through and put this together. Okay, so the way I'd like to do this, first of all, is just start with these points. It's unit circle. So you got 0, 1, 0, 1, <laughs> negative 1, 0. Students hardly ever mess up on these points. Okay, got that. Now, the way that I've been teaching you guys how to do this is just get these points. Okay, and you may have come up with a different strategy by now on how to remember this. As long as it's right, I don't care. So the thing is, the x values get bigger. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go 1, 2, 3. That's just the way I remember it. The y values get bigger. So 1, 2, 3, right? What else? They all are divided by 2. That's also another easy thing to remember. All across the unit circle, everything is divided by 2. Yeah, the square root of 1, you don't worry about. Now, you do the square root of the numerators, right? So you're going to do square root of 3, square root of 2, square root of 3 like that. You got it. That's it. You don't do a square root of 1 because it's unnecessary, okay? Now, once you get this, well, all that's going to happen is these points over here are just going to end up being the negative points like this. So this is just going to be negative 1 half and square root of 3 over 2 then this is going to be negative square root of 2 over 2, square root of 2 over 2. This one's going to be negative square root of 3 over 2 and 1 half like that. Okay, it's just because of the quadrant you're in. Okay, now if you go here, what happens? The y's change. If you're down here, the y's go negative. Okay, so this one's just going to be same x, different y. Same thing here, same x, different y. Same thing here, one half, different y like that. So it's very logical. If you get those first three points, the rest of them are simple. And then what happens over here? Both things are negative. So you'd have negative root 3 over 2, negative 1 half, and so forth. Negative root 2 over 2, negative root 2 over 2, negative 1 half, <coughs> negative square root of 3 over 2. That's fast, isn't it? Okay, so if you just learn those first three points, and it's easy to get the rest, okay? Now, the way that I do the... The angles, let me show you the way I do the angles, because one of the things I'm trying to get you guys to learn how to do is to count these things out pretty quickly. So I'm going to just kind of circle or highlight going by 45 degrees. This is just the way I like to show students how to do this. You can memorize it, too, if you want to. So we're going to go 0, 45, 90, 135, 180, 225, like that. I'm looking at 45 degree things. Okay, that's just my way of doing this. Okay, so what I'm going to do from here now is when I do these angles is I'm simply going to count by pi over 4. Pi over 4 is 45 degrees. If you remember that, it's helpful. Okay, if you don't, convert it. So I go like this. Of course, you obviously know that's 0. Everybody always gets that one right. Then it's pi over 4. Then it's 2 pi over 4, however you would want to reduce that. Okay, then it's 3 pi over 4. Then this is pi, so that's really 4 pi over 4. This one is 5 pi over 4. Whoops, stop that. 4, then we got 6 pi over 4, which is 3 pi over 2. Okay, then this one is 7 pi over 4. Okay, that's how I do that. Okay, count by pi over 4. Okay, you don't have to do that. If you've come up with a different way of doing that, that's fine with me. 
Okay, now what I do next thing is I do the, the 30 degree things. Okay, so I'm going to go by 30s. Okay, so what you kind of do on this is just disregard the 45s. Now you still got to count out the quadrantal angles. So you can go through and count by 30s like this. Okay, so this is just the way I, I look at this is uh, we know that pi over 6 is 30 degrees like this. Okay, so what I do is I just go like this. Okay, that's pi over 6. This one is what? 2 pi over 6. Of course, you would reduce that to pi over 3, though. This one is 3 pi over 6. So this one goes to 4 pi over 6. This one goes to 5 pi over 6. This one is 6 pi over 6, 7 pi over 6, 8 pi over 6, 9 pi over 6. I'm not reducing, but you get the idea. 10 pi over 6, 11 pi over 6, like that. I didn't take the time to reduce, but you should do that. Okay, that's it. Okay, is that pretty simple? Okay, you're going to do that throughout the semester. So, I mean, it's something that you want to be sure that you're totally confident with. Okay? What's that? I didn't hear what you said. Uh, oh, it doesn't matter. I, yeah, the, yeah, the 3 pi over 2 I should have highlighted because you're going by 30s. You're going 30, 60, 90, and so forth like that. But I did count correctly. Okay, at least I did that. Okay, all right. Now, what I want to do on the next thing here, I'm going to kind of just do these problems down at the bottom, okay? So the other thing is, is you want to be able to just do any trig function of any value on a unit circle, okay? So uh, the idea with this is, if you're doing the sine of 5 pi over 3, well, you've got to find 5 pi over 3, first of all. So uh, find where 5 pi over 3 is, and it's actually right here. That point right there, I didn't reduce that, so that's 5 pi over 3. So uh, what's the sine? It's the y value, right? The sine's the y value, so that's going to be negative square root of 3 over 2, okay? The cosine is the x value, right? Now, I can ask angles, so of course if this is a negative angle, well, what are you doing? You're going clockwise, so just kind of count it out. So that's negative 180 plus 30 more, so the cosine is the x value, so that's also negative square root of 3 over 2, okay? So that's what you do, okay? If you want to do a tangent, well, the tangent's definition is y over x. So you need to find negative pi over 2. Well, negative pi over 2 is clockwise 90 degrees. Okay, so you got that. So if you looked at y over x, you would have negative 1 over 0. So what do you say? You say it's undefined, like that. Okay, so you get that. Okay, how do you find a cotangent? You say x over y. Okay, so 5 pi over 6, uh, 5 pi over 6 is right here, okay, so the x value is negative square root of 3 over 2, and the y value is 1 half, so what you could do on this is just do negative 3 over 2 times 2 over 1, so that would give an answer of negative square root of 3, like that, okay, that's it. So you got to do the unit circle, and then you got to be able to answer any question possible about it. Okay? All right? All right, is that good? Okay? All right, if you don't know how to do the unit circle, the test will be a disaster. So you got to be able to know how to do that. Okay, just a couple more things on this page, and then I want to go over a couple of things on the calculator part, and then I want to finish up class with, with going over a few more things on 2.2. All right, so this is another kind of standard type of problem to go through and look at is I'm testing you over really two things on this problem. First of all, I've given you, let me zoom on this just a little bit here. Okay, what I've done is I've given you uh, this statement. So I've given you the cosine of alpha is negative 2 over 13. So what's the definition of the cosine? X over R. X over, X over R. So see, I've given you those two variables. I've given you that X equals negative 2, and I've given you that r is square root of 13, okay? And r is always positive, right? Okay, so that negative has to go with the x, okay? All right, now if you want to find what y is, you got to do the Pythagorean theorem. So we know that r squared is equal to x squared plus y squared. 
like this. So that's going to give square root of 13 squared. X is negative 2, so negative 2 squared, plus y squared, like that. Okay, so that's going to give 13 equals 4 plus y squared. Okay, now if you subtract 4 from both sides, you can do that in your head if you want to, you get y squared equals 9. Square root both sides. Technically, at this stage, you get plus or minus 3. Now, our job is going to be to figure out which it is. Okay? All right, so we need to talk about that a little bit, okay? So basically on this type of a problem, I'm giving you two, two of the three variables, and you've got to find the third one. All right, now I've given you two clues to figure out what quadrant you're in. So I've given you this. You, generally, the way I've taught you guys how to do this is like this, okay? First of all, where is the sign negative? It's down here. Okay, so you've got to know that. It's where y is negative. Okay, the sign is the y value. Okay, all right. I gave you a negative cosine. Where is the cosine negative? It's where x is negative. X is negative there and there. So what quadrant am I in? I'm in 3. Okay, so that means that the value of y has to be negative 3, like that. That's how we know that. So I have to give you that information, otherwise you can't get the signs right. Okay, does that make sense to everybody? Okay, all right. Now we just put this together, okay? So the sign is y over r. So this is going to be negative 3 over square root of 13. And then rationalize that. You can rationalize in your head if you want to. I don't care if you do that. So we got that, okay? The cosecant would be the reciprocal of the sign. So that's going to be negative square root of 13 over 3, okay? Uh, I gave you the cosine. So the secant is just the reciprocal of the cosine. So that's going to be negative square root of 13 over 2. Tangents y over x, so I gave y is negative 3, and I gave x is negative 2, so that will give 3 halves. And then the cotangent is the reciprocal of the tangent, so that's 2 thirds like that. So that's how you do that, okay? What am I testing you on? Several things. Definitions and signs. That's it. Okay, Pythagorean relationship too. Okay, so does that look okay to everybody? Okay, that's also a pretty standard kind of thing that I like to, to go through on a on an exam, the first exam in this class. Okay, All right, and uh, this one actually should be on the calculator part. I don't know why I did that. I'm gonna go ahead and go over this, but anything that has to do with angular and linear linear velocity is on the calculator part of the exam. Okay, because you'd have to do that. Well, let's go ahead and, and take a look at this then. And the way this works is like this. So first of all, this is what's real critical on this problem. I said that, that the, the fan moves at 2.5 revolutions per minute. So what did I give you? I gave you an angular velocity. That's the whole key to these problems, is to know what I gave you. Omega is the variable we use for angular velocity. So that's going to be angular velocity is 2.5 revolutions per minute. Now typically we like this to be in radians per unit of time. So I'm going to do a conversion. Okay, so what do we know about one revolution in radians? Two pi. One, one lap around the circle is the same thing as two pi radians, like that. Okay, so we crunch that out and then we're going to get omega equals, and actually I'll just, that's five pi radians per minute. And you, we'll end up going to the calculator here in a minute. Okay, so that's what we get. Okay, so that is the angular velocity in radians per minute. Okay, on that. Now, with this one, uh, on this one against the linear velocity, I give you the formulas. For, so the linear velocity formula is r omega. So I gave you everything you needed to know in this. Now the length of the fan blade, I really need to be more clear about that. You know, I might do put a picture on that or something like this. I'm talking about that being the radius. That's the fan blade. So what you would do on this problem then to finish this up is you would just take the 15 inches, okay, and then you would do times the angular velocity like that, and then you would have that. But the thing that I want you to do on this problem also is to make sure that you have this in miles per hour, okay? The length of 15 inches is the diameter, right? No, the, uh, not necessarily. That's what I was saying. You, I would have to make that clear to you. Oh, okay. 
Okay, I mean a fan blade could be a diameter, it could be a radius, it depends on the fan, right? So I'm just saying that it's the radius, okay? If it was a diameter, then you'd cut it in half, then you'd know what to do. Okay, so the next thing I want to do then is, is this, so we need to do a conversion, so we're going miles per hour, okay? So it goes like this, there's 12 inches, make up one foot, okay? Then, let's see on this, so that'll get rid of the... Um, the inches, like that, and then we know that in feet there is 5,280 feet in a mile. And by the way, I usually will give conversion factors if you don't know them. A lot of international students don't know this. Yeah. Okay, is that true for those, those of you who are the international yeah. students? Okay. I mean, it's, you know, it's just you don't use that in different parts of the world. And then the other thing would be um, ch convert the minutes to an hour. So if you did that, we would have. 60 minutes goes with one hour, okay? So partially what you're doing on this is just that conversion like that then, okay? Then you could go through basically, and then you could get, um, get and this would be something I'd expect you to use on the calculator, so you can get that out then like that, okay? All right, and the way that you would do this on your calculator here, I would just do 15, and then times 5, I would use the pi key to get a little bit greater accuracy. And then times 60, okay, that'll give what the numerator is, like that. And then you can divide, you can do this in one step like this, you can say divide by, then you could say parentheses, uh, 12 times 5280, if you want to do it that way, or you can take multiple steps if you want to like that. And then that would give, the answer would be 0.22 miles per hour, like that, okay? Just round it off like that. Okay. Okay, so that's a pretty good problem. That's again, you would want to be able to use your calculator on that. Okay. All right. <laughs> Any questions? Okay. All right. So that's a very good overview. Now, but about extra credit final. I mean, that's a good thing to do as well. To kind of go through and 